The patron saint of Washington, D.C. Freemasonry. Who was he and how did he earn such a lofty title? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry channel. I'm Maynard Edwards, 32nd degree KCCH. Take a second, subscribe to the channel. It'll only take you a second. And make sure you like the video. Drop a comment below. And especially if you're a Freemason, shout out your lodge, shout out your valley, but you got to say hi to us. Benjamin B. French, he was a member of the Lincoln administration and an early example of what you might call a Washington insider. He was a mover and a shaker in D.C. He was very active also as a Freemason, a Grand Master in Washington, D.C., in fact. And here to tell us more about Brother Benjamin B. French is Valley of D.C. historian Brother Chris Ruley, 32nd degree KCCH. We are in the executive chamber sitting in what uh, Masons would refer to as the West. Uh, and uh, But this beautiful room that we're in, we're here because it's uh, summertime and this is air conditioned. Yes, so, thank and God. We're, and we're not idiots. So uh, recently our development team acquired a really cool piece and they, they did a talk on it that's here on the YouTube channel all about uh, this particular sword that was gifted to Albert Pike, who was our Grand Commander early on, to a man named Benjamin B. French. And Benjamin B. French was a big time Washington, D.C. Mason back in the day, let's let's yeah. say. Yeah, and yeah. his name pops up a lot. So now that we've heard a little bit about the sword and about the relationship between Pike and French uh, from our folks in development, I thought I would ask you, uh, who was Benjamin French? So he, I mean, again, he's one of these guys, like his name pops up everywhere. In the history of the, in the written history for the Grand Lodge DC, he is referred to as the patron saint of Washington Freemasonry. Really? That is the title that he is given after his death, the patron saint. And in, in many ways, he actually is one of the most transformative, one of the most important Masons in the District of Columbia over time. French was from New Hampshire. He was actually born in the 18, like on 1800, in the, you know, and so he was born during a time when this is, you know, like the Washington just became the District of Columbia 10 years before people, uh, the district was, the order was, you gotta get all the federal buildings done by 1800 to move everything in. He becomes a Mason around 1826. So if you're looking at the time frame, he becomes a Mason during the anti-Masonic period. Right, because the anti-Masonic period starts with the Morgan affair for Masonic scholars. That starts around 1827, which is yes. when Morgan vanished. And uh, we'll have to do a video on the Morgan affair itself. Sure. That's another one you can talk about. Happy to talk about. Um, and, and that started a period of about 10, 12, 14 years, kind of depending on where you are in the country yeah. of anti-Masonic sentiment, right. including an anti-Masonic political party, the first yeah. third party That's right. ever. So he's coming up in this time. He's starting his Masonic career during the anti-Masonic period where it's dangerous for you to become a politician because your career could be over just being associated. So I think that really speaks to the individual. He, he joined Freemasonry. He did not decide, you know, you know what? My career, my political career is more important than, than the Masonic Lodge in which I'm a member, so I'm, I'm not. He didn't do that. He decided to stay. And, uh, you know, during this period, he serves as worshipful master. He actually joins a couple lodges. He moves around because of his political career. Uh, he joins a couple lodges. He serves as master. He eventually becomes deputy, you know, de deputy grand master uh, for his region. So it's, it's interesting that that's the beginning. I, I sort of call him a wartime Mason because it's in a, in a period where there's a lot of pressure on Freemasons, but he sticks to it because he knows that's important. And then around the 1830s, late in the 1830s, he moves to the District of Columbia to serve as a clerk at the Capitol. And we're not talking about the clerk of the Capitol, just an assistant clerk, assist, right. you know, in the House of Representatives. So he's involved in a lot of the, the politics, the activity, and because of his political affiliations and because of his connection in Congress, he starts to, to be really become something in the district. He starts to join political groups and he becomes part of the city council and he's really active and you can sort of tell he becomes really active. One of the nice things, one of the things we're sort of blessed with is the fact that he actually has uh, his diary. He does a great job writing everything down and his diary is preserved at the Library of Congress. So you can go to the Library of Congress and read um, his diary, and it goes into 
amazing detail of like met with president so-and-so shook his hand went to the white house for a pre because of his you know all of his political associations he does not join freemasonry until 1846 and by that i mean join dc, DC he doesn't Masonry. join a so, dc lodge until so he's still a member back in his hometown he is still a member in his lodge he is but referred to here. as yeah but he spends the about 10 years right 1833 1834 he comes to dc 1846 is when he joins a lodge in D.C. or affiliates, if you want to be technical. He joins a lodge in D.C., National Lodge Number 12. Um, and he, for that, for those first 10 years, he's really focusing on his work. In fact, first couple of years, his roommate is Franklin Pierce, who would eventually become president. president. Yeah. So again, he's really focused on politics. He's focused on his craft. He's working. Excuse me. He's focused on you know, being the best that he can in his job and his profession. Now, you know what, that that period of, of pause in yeah, his Masonic sure. career is not all that unusual even today. A man will join when he's kind of young, yes. is, you know, get that clock started, so to speak. Uh, maybe he's gotten out of college and, yeah. and likes the fraternal experience there sure. or something to that effect, or a, a D. Malay, or there was no D. Malay at that point in time. But, you know, he, he's a younger man. He gets right. involved to try and, and push himself in the community a little bit more to get his his life and his career started. Yeah. And then his life and his career starts and he becomes a little too busy for Freemasonry. Sure. So you take that step back. And then once things start to settle and you've got a little security after 10 years yes. or so, back to launch. Right. And, and that's what he does. And he's sort of, the way that he gets back into Lodge is really impressive because I said he starts in 1846, he affiliates in 1846. The next year, Grandmaster or the Masons of DC, hey, do you want to become Grandmaster? So I think what happened was, you know, over time, he built that clout. People recognized him as a Mason. He went to Masonic events. He sort of started that rapport of Freemasons in DC. He started to build that rapport. And then over time, it was like, you know what? Maybe it is time that I join back. And so the Grand Lodge of DC, the next year after he becomes Mason, they're like, maybe uh, you want to consider becoming Grand Master. And so he becomes Grand Master. He's elected Grand Master in 1847. Now, was this a case of, uh, there There are situations where lodges have a tough time finding somebody that wants to take the job of Worshipful Master. No, so absolutely this, not. There were other guys yes, who could have done it. Yes, absolutely. There were, there were plenty of guys. In fact, that first decade or two decades of DC Freemasonry, or three decades really, they were prominent members of society. William W. Seaton, a former mayor of the District of Columbia, wrote the newspaper, one of the biggest newspapers in the district, very active in Freemasonry at the time. Other mayors were also very active. Uh, the district you know, had grandmasters who served in Congress, who served in the White House, who served in the you know, various federal departments, as they, as they called them back then. And so there was no problem identifying capable individuals who would become grandmaster. But I think because of where French was, where he was going, the momentum that drove him and the things that he was doing in Congress and in politics, they, the DC Freemasons were looking at him and said, this guy represents a very good portion of Freemasonry that we wanna show off and so we wanna make him Grand Master. And so I think that's what happened. They, there, was, there was a movement to make him the Grand Master. Obviously it happened because a year after he affiliates, he becomes Grand Master of DC. That said, he still remains very active in Blue Lodge. It's not like he becomes Grand Master and then he goes off and, and does other things. He stays Grand Master for about six to seven years. Wow. This is not a guy that shows up for one year or two years, and then peace shakes out. hands, kisses babies, and leaves. He is very active. And in fact, Grand Lodge DC votes for a guy for six to seven years and says, we respect what he's doing. He's doing a great job. The year after he becomes Grand Master, 1847, we said he becomes Grand Master. 1848 lays the cornerstone of Smithsonian. Not a bad gig. Right. The, or the following year, or a couple of years later, he lays the cornerstone of the Washington Monument. Not a bad gig. Now, he lays the cornerstone of the extension to the United States Capitol, and there's a really great story about that. So Millard Fillmore is the president that year when they're ex the first extension to the United States Capitol. This is 1851. So this is a couple of years mm -hmm. into him being Grandmaster. In his diary, he actually recounts this story where he goes, um, you know, I, I met with the architect of the Capitol a couple of days ago. He's, I know him to be a Freemason. He acknowledges him as brother in his diary. And the architect of the Capitol says, hey, by the way, um, hey, French, you know, in a couple weeks, we're going to be laying the cornerstone for the extension of the United States Capitol. Can you start the process of getting ready? Because we want to lay a Masonic cornerstone. And he goes, are you sure about that? Because Millard Fillmore is president. And, and as the, I'm paraphrasing, of course, right, right. but the way he's saying it is, you know, 
I know him to be an anti-Mason. In fact, Millard Fillmore started his political career in New York as an anti-Mason. So this is, again, going back to this flashes of anti-Masonry. And he knew there was still something there. And he doesn't want to cause bad blood with him and this president and say, no. you know, hey... There's a political. Let's, angle let's be to this nice. Would, exactly. Why would you do that to a sitting right, president right. who you know has, a, and it's this is the building. Yeah. Why? So he's being yeah. considerate. He's not. A, by the way, he's not admonishing the cap, architect of the Capitol. He's like, "Are you sure about that? Because I'm not going to do it because this guy's an anti-Mason." He's saying, "Are you sure about that? Because there's, I think, I think there's still a little bit of anti-Masonic blood in Millard Fillmore's system, and so he he recommends, or I think the way that it's worded is a little unclear, but. The architect of the Capitol eventually goes back to the president and confirms, hey, by the way, we're doing this in a couple of weeks. Are, are, you know, we're going to have the Masons do it because they've always done it. They've done it for the first, you know, the first cornerstone. They've done it for the city hall. They've done it for the Smithsonian. We did it for the Washington Monument. And Millard Fillmore, in a way, the way that French says it in his writings is, um, yeah, I, you know, if we invite the Masons, we've got to invite the Odd Fellows. We've got to invite the Red Men. We've got to invite all these other groups, fraternal can, organizations that were active can, at the time. Do can we ha do we have to? Can we like not do this? Can we just do make this a non? Right. You know, can we? Why are we making this more complicated? Well, he, our tech capital goes back to French and is like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you know he didn't. But because of this process, word starts to go around the Masonic circle in D.C. And by the way, not just the Masonic Circle in D.C., but the Masonic Circle in the Capitol. And there's a little bit of pressure applied to the president. Now, French is very clear in his writing because I think he's writing as if people in the future are going to read this. So the way he words it, and I'm paraphrasing, is, you know, the influence of Freemasonry even convinced the president to change his mind. And so that, and that he says, is clearly because of the Masons in the Capitol, the Masons in the district, who were able to lobby the president and say, you have to do this. The, ca the Masons have been doing this for you know years before you even got here. And the irony there is that's exactly what the anti-Masonic sentiment was right. about, was that right. the Masons had undue influence over yes. government and civic organizations. So, right, right, right. So here it is in practice. Well, it's it's not undue. I think what they were what they were saying was you know, there's a tradition here. Right. And 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 you're coming in as president. You are a steward of this office. We get it. But we have been doing this thing for so many years, for right. decades. That you know. first stone over there that we can't find now, Washington himself right. laid right. that. You know, now this yes. another Mason should yes. do this. One. Yeah. As a little, you know, maybe as a little twist to French, you know, he finally gets the announcement. Yes, fine, I'll let the Masons do it, but only a couple days in advance. He so he has less than a week to to organize a national Masonic cornerstone ceremony at the Capitol, and so. There's about 200 or so Masons that now, mind you, Smithsonian, the, monu the Washington Monument, four to 5,000 Masons, Masons from Pennsylvania, Virginia. All over the show. And he only could get, you know, let's get as many people as we can. We got a couple days to do this. You know how it is, herding cats, yeah. herding Masons. Getting Masons to do anything is tricky. Imagine, and then you have, two, you have a couple days to get this done. He does get it done. And as a nice little interaction, he asks the president, why don't you join me in the trench? So he actually, Lord Fillmore goes down into the trench where the cornerstone is, and the Grand Master says, please observe the stone and, and mark it to make sure that it's okay. And so he actually goes and he checks and goes, okay, you know, most worshipful Grand Master, the stone is prepared and ready for, for your ceremony. So that's a story. By the right. way, we haven't even gotten to the sword yet. Right, right, right. That's, no, no, that's no. The, the sword's that, a whole separate. That's Benjamin thing. B. French. That's that's the that's the, the character guy. and story of Benjamin B. French. In his diary, I think in eighteen fifty in eighteen in the mid eighteen fifties, he writes, uh, you know, today I met with a gentleman named Albert Pike. I found him to be a you know a well rounded you know individual of good character and sport. And so this, and this would have been he, prior to Pike moving to Washington, D.C., which was eight, 18... The summer of 1869. Yeah, so, so this if is he's years, still a grandmaster, so it's a decade. This is before the Civil yeah, War. Decade. This is before the Civil War. And so he mentions, I met this guy named Albert Pike. He's an interesting character. He seems like a good guy. You know, he seems to be a well-rounded individual. How did they meet? They met through Freemasonry. Because at this time, Pike was going up. He started in the Royal Arch. He mm -hmm. was a grand high priest. That process got him connected with Mackey and all these other individuals. Mackey then confirms the, the Scottish Rite degrees on him. And then Mackey at this time is saying, you know, this guy is, is good enough. He, you know, he's writing the ritual. He's rewriting the ritual. He's working on the ritual for the Scottish Rite. 
and he's connecting him with all these other Masons. And so this is where, this is where Benjamin B. French gets involved because he's in this process. Benjamin B. French actually writes in his diary that he conferred the Knights Templar. He introduced and brought uh, Albert Pike. Pike into the Knights Templar through Washington Commandery One in DC. A couple months later, they bring in Sam Houston, president of Texas. So key individuals and figures, French is bringing these individuals in and showing them what Freemasonry is and can be and what DC Freemasonry is. And I think what French does a really good job is he, he mixes and brings in politics and Freemasonry and, and how we communicate about Freemasonry. So in a sense, he's a very early Masonic influencer in, in you can modern say that. parlance. Absolute, you know, absolutely. Yeah, he, he was a person who not only influenced others, but he got other people who were influencers themselves yes. to become yes. members of the craft. Yes. I think what French does well, like sort of we say about you know, Albert Pike, you know, he, wrote, he wrote the rituals or he wrote, rewrote the rituals one of Albert Pike's really great claim to fame is he actually did a very good job organizing the Scottish Rite. Now take that and apply that to Benjamin B. French. Yes, Benjamin B. French did all these interesting things and he laid cornerstones, but what he did is he did a very good job of communicating Freemasonry using the signs and symbols and the aprons and the jewels and all that and introducing it to the public. These are not some kooky, crazy guys that sit in the corner. These are politicians, these are businessmen, these are active in the community, they're engaging with the community, like Benjamin B. French. So, you know, French is a, you know, if you didn't, if you saw him, you go, this guy was such a good political, you know, individual mover and shaker in DC. And then there's a completely different side of him where he's publicly a Mason, he's proud of it, he's showing, you know, one of the things that he does well is, and he starts with it is, he collects all the George Washington Masonic regalia. So the apron, the gavel, the trowel. He is one of the first to say, hey, by the way, we I'm laying this corner, all this. but I'm laying this cornerstone and I'm doing it with Washington stuff because it's Freemasonry. He finds, a, he finds a really good way of saying Freemasonry is involved in American history. He intertwines, he finds a way of communicating and intertwining history and Freemasonry. And this is one of the first people that's done it very well. And, and now we have Americanism, we have you know, a lot of different things that we, we arrange with Freemasonry. Sure. But he was one of the first. He said, we can put these different topics together and we can find a way where Freemasonry, it's not just that Freemasonry did these things, but it was involved with really interesting people like George Washington. So it's, it's taking all those threads, Washington yes. and the Capitol and, yes. Smith, and, and pulling and them the all together and weaving them into a single fabric yes. that we think of as American yes. Freemasonry yes. in, in our context yes. today. He takes the symbols, he takes the regalia, he takes the tools, he takes the public setting, and he weaves them into a narrative, a story that talks about Freemasonry. It's not this interesting, kooky thing that you don't know anything about. He's showing it to you in public. He's providing it to you. He's showing it to the public. He's showing it to people. He's showing it to non-Masons. And what do we see because of that? We see a gradual increase in interest in Freemason in the District of Columbia. We see more lodges. We see more organizations, more groups coming in. French is bringing them in. Meanwhile, by the way, during this entire process, he joins the General Grand Chapter and serves as the recorder. He joins the General Grand Encampment and serves as a recorder. Over time, he becomes the Grand Master of the Grand Encampment of Knights Templar during the Civil War. So throughout the Civil War, French is serving as the highest Knights Templar in the United States. Now the Civil War presents a problem for the relationship between French and Pike <clears throat> because they're on opposite sides of that. Uh, Pike uh, was famously a, a Confederate general for about six months and either yes. quit or got fired, depending on who you ask. And Discharged. we're not going to get into that. Sure. Uh, and then French was in the Lincoln administration. Yes. So these are not guys that are necessarily going to be able to, to have a very close relationship at that point in time. And yet their relationship endures, not only the war, but it, yes. it's, it, you know, other things. And that's where this sword comes into play. If you read Pike's, I'm sorry, if you read French's journal, what you get a sense is this war is a conflict. Absolutely, civil war is a conflict and there's a real struggle that is going on. But I think he, he sees Freemasonry as beyond or above that conflict. It endures. Freemasonry shall endure regardless of where this political or strife is happening. The way he words it is yes, we are, we are involved in this battle but Freemasonry serves as a, as a way of being a gentleman beyond, it, it sort of moves past, it, 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 it sort of, um, uh, you know, 
It's, it's above the fray. So it's to speak. above the fray. It goes beyond these physical, political things. It's more gentlemanly. It's more respectable. It has a higher, you know, like we can go over here and fight about this. Yes. But when we come over here and we're Masons, absolutely. Which is the, which is the role Masonry plays in many ways throughout history and especially today. There's so much division in the world. Right. Masons go in the lodges, shut the doors, and that's yes. gone. And yes. we're just you know yes. all good men acknowledging that okay there's a disagreement over here but yes and so that's that's where Absolutely. the relationship between pike and french was. yes and it's written and it's encoded in his diary you can see it in his diary he's like yes we're going through these struggles but there has to be something better now to learn more about the sword that benjamin b french presented to albert pike make sure you click the link above or in the description below to learn about how the scottish right came into possession of that sword and some really interesting facts about it and what story that that artifact in particular tells. It's pretty fascinating. I hope you'll check it out. As always, thanks to Chris Ruley, 32nd Degree KCCH, and we will catch you next time here on the channel. Don't forget, subscribe. Click the subscribe button. Turn on those notifications. Give us a thumbs up. Share it with your brothers. And above all, drop a comment below. We love to hear from you. I'm Maynard Edwards. Thanks for watching.